Hello, I am Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. I am also wearing, as I realise as I start talking, the world's wrinkliest shirt. Uh, this has just been in my bag and is therefore horrible. Anyway, uh, I am still dog sitting the wonderful Annie and uh, I wanted to talk about the Booker Prize in a move that will surprise absolutely nobody. Um, and so recently I covered the 1969 Booker Prize, the first ever book, uh, a Booker Prize. And that was obviously kind of quite an innovative and exciting one. Um, and, you know, started what we've seen ever since. And it's sort of given me a reason to live, apparently. <laughs> or at least just keep chatting to a camera. Um, but in between the 1969 and the 1970 Booker Prize, there was a change in the way that the prize was sort of done in, in, in sort of some of the entry rules. And the way the prize changed was instead of looking at books from, um, from the year before, it looked at books that year. So the 1969 Booker Prize mostly looked at books from 1968, and the 1970 Booker Prize, the, the first sort of proper one, mostly looked at 19, the books released in 1970, which is the, the same structure that we do now, where it's sort of a sort of October to October thing. And so as a result, there was this sort of tranche, using the word tranche really casually there, there was a selection of books that missed out because essentially they were released somewhere in between those two bits and therefore were not eligible. And this is therefore known as the lost Man Booker Prize, and that's what we're going to be speaking about today. Um, and uh, what I think is really interesting about this, um, as compared to other Booker Prizes, is that this selection has been made sort of retroactively. You know, we, we're kind of looking back and thinking what books would have been big at the time. And, you know, this, this prize was only done sort of a few years ago. And so instead of you know, it kind of got me thinking, you know, with the, the 2021 Booker Prize has recently happened. And in that, you know, that's a group of authors reading books in that moment, thinking about what's really relevant to the time. And it may well be that in five, ten years, those books no longer seem as relevant. Or in fact, it might be that other books that are more timely just didn't quite make it over and, you know, kind of over the sort of finish line. Um, you know, if we think as well, like something like Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, um, that didn't win the Booker Prize. But I think now, if the the if if that same shortlist were to be run again, I think Handmaid's Tale would probably come out on top because that book would feel more relevant and sort of pressing to us now. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, it's really sad that that book still has some sort of relevance in in the world um, in that sense. Uh, but. That kind of got me thinking because I do wonder, you know, with the 2021 prize, is that something that's also going to happen? Anyway, fast forward or rewind back to 1969 and therefore our lost Man Booker Prize. And we, get, I say man, because actually was it Man Booker Prize at that point? Probably wasn't. I don't think the sponsors were happening then. So it would have been the Booker Prize or with some other sponsor. Anyway, that's irrelevant. Uh, and six books were chosen. And again, what I think is really interesting is that by looking at it retroactively, we end up again with a sort of bigger cast of big name authors. Um, authors who have sort of published many, many books since and are sort of known and beloved. Um, whereas, for example, if it had been done in the year itself, maybe would have, we would have got a different crop of books. Anyway, of the six that we got, here are those shortlisted books. So the book that won this, and I think there was a, a sort of an online poll to vote for this, and this book won fairly, I mean, fairly substantially. I think it was a, sort of a, a bit of a runaway. And that is J.G. Farrell with Troubles. Now, what is actually then interesting about this old prize kind of going in is it therefore means that when J.G. Farrell won the Booker Prize in 1973 uh, for the Siege of Krishnapur, that would technically have been his second win by this sort of metric. Obviously, at the time, that was his first and, you know, whatever. So J.G. Farrell, um, an Irish author, uh, uh, and this book, Troubles, does not take a genius to see where some of these what the troubles might be. But this story concerns a man who is sort of in some ways fairly immune or kind of not really paying that much attention to the, the his, his, sort of historical and political changes going on around him. And he instead is sort of just in love with, uh, well, sort of in love with a woman. It's a bit of a complicated relationship he has with this woman where there is this sort of bizarre, quite funny plot um, around waiting for letters from each other and at one point there is a letter that speaks about um, 
exactly what's going to happen next and it either sort of never really gets delivered or it sort of it well it's withheld for a really long time and so basically so much of the book centers around the fact that this character is just really interested in understanding what's going on with this um, this moment and really not thinking about what's happening in the world around him and obviously fairly seismic changes are happening in Ireland at this time and it's it's quite a funny and clever book in that sense that it really looks at what it means to be in the moment historically um, and I can kind of see why this is a book that looking back also would feel very much like a winner because with the kind of added um, hindsight I guess of us having years of history and then looking back at Ireland this book has a sort of slightly more resonance that there's a real understanding that actually this speaks to a lot of what was happening and the fact that characters weren't taking it seriously is a sort of a big part of this. I will say this book didn't fully work for me. It works for me more than Siege of Krishnapur. Um, I mean in my mind Siege of Krishnapur wouldn't have been my favourite to win um, but I think this book is quite clever in um, how it approaches it. I find it a lot more accessible, a lot funnier, um, a little bit more self-aware than Siege of Krishnapur was I think and as a result and, and I think partly because it's sort of on slightly more familiar ground with talking about Ireland as opposed to India. I think there's something that's aged better about it because I think my, a lot of my issues with Siege of Krishnapur was that it, I, I, something about the way sort of Indian characters in the book are treated did not sit comfortably with me. Um, whereas I think in, in this there's, you know, slightly easier ground for that to work. And so I see why this one, it would not have been my personal choice for the winner as we will see from the rest of the shortlist. Quick pause in between this just to show you Annie who is just, hang on, where is she? Let's see if I can get this. She's just, she's just having a little, a little sleep. Um, she definitely looks like she has sort of, um, I don't know, she's sort of passed out, which is probably fairly true. She's now rolling around on the floor being very cute. So there we go. The joys of dog sitting. I, I mean, she's, she's a babe. I, I absolutely love her. Anyway, back to the book. Next up, alphabetically going through the shortlist, is Nina Borden with Birds on the Trees. And uh, this book, I did not expect anything really going into it. I kind of, I, from the, the, the way the sort of blurb was written, I thought it might be kind of interesting, but didn't really know what to, to think going in. And it's a really beautifully done book. It, it, it's focused around uh, this couple, but particularly this sort of mother figure at the heart of it, Maggie. And she, um, we're kind of, the early bit of this book, this sort of prologue, sets us up to see this kind of, not to say rich versus poor, but you know, there's there's a there's a family who is somewhat comfortable, and when there's a, a poor child who is not being very well looked after, or at least they think, um, they take this kid in, and that kind of sets up a bit of this this thing for the kind of idea of what it feels, what it is like to nurture someone and to raise someone and look after them. And in fact, there is a quote later on, well, yeah, there's a part later on in the book where, um they sort of say well you know looking after a child uh, is about more than just making sure they have shoes and that they're fed um you know there's a kind of nourishing that needs to happen in terms of their souls and, and being looked after and feeling secure and if i mean i say this with annie uh, <laughs> where i'm sort of making sure that she's not only getting walks and uh and sort of food but i'm you know giving her some sort of affection and she mostly just responds by licking my face which I'm gonna take um you know that's the best offer I've had in days I'll take that uh, anyway complete side point there about Annie but I think in some ways that is sort of the core heart of this book and Maggie um and her, her son Toby have this really difficult relationship and particularly the thing that becomes difficult about Toby is he sort of falls Sort of off the he kind of goes off the rails in some way he develops quite a strong drug problem um and it it really i think the book is very well handled in terms of how it talks about the impact of that on everybody in the family so uh not everybody can kind of interact with him in in the way that he sort of needs. thank you Annie. You just give yourself a little give yourself a little lick uh and um he is sort of not fully able to be present in the family and he feels sort of shunned and th the problem gets worse and worse the more his drug problem develops because obviously that puts even more of a, a barrier to them for looking after him and every time he is there he is he sort of becomes the the problem um in the family that they're trying to solve and it's then really interesting how generationally there's this 
beautiful discussion between um, Maggie's mother, who is sort of trying to help support, and Maggie as this writer who is kind of both very able to understand her own flaws and understand the situation, but also does not know how to cope with Toby. And actually, you know, you know Toby's grandmother, so Maggie's mother, um, is sort of able to see things that other characters can't. And so she says, he doesn't need that, you know, he, he needs you to do this. And what I thought was really clever and pushed this book even, you know, made me love it even more, was the way it kind of deals with actually the format and, uh, of language for this. So Maggie, as a writer, has moments where she's, you know, the, the story is told sort of from her perspective. Um, in But at times we switch to her personal writing. So her writing either a bit of a novel or kind of a, a post of some kind. And, and what is really interesting about that is sort of there's this sort of public Maggie who is kind of like, right, I'm a mother, I'm trying to solve this problem, how do we do this? Um, and sort of trying to muddle through, and then absolute moments of her kind of crippling self-doubt in her writing, where she talks about, um, so a good example, for example, she, she's trying to do some maths, and we suddenly get a flashback to her struggling with maths in school in a way where you feel like this woman has grown up and has not let go of the shame, and this sort of burning, searing shame of what it was like to be that and to, to sort of feel stupid and not be able to do something. And it's so poignant and so cleverly done. And I, I found it really profound and really touching um, as a book. And I thought that was really, really cleverly done. Um, and it just gave such a warmth and depth to so many of the, the characters in so many in so, in so many ways. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed this book. I thought it was a, a sort of little gem that has sort of gone a bit under noticed, I think. I think Nina Borden is an author who I'd heard of, but I really haven't checked out apart from apart from this, and I very highly recommend this book. I think, sort of, spoiler alert, I think may be my winner from this shortlist. Next up, uh, Shirley Hazard with The Bay of Noon. And so Shirley Hazard uh, was an uh, Australian author, and this book does some really clever things in this, uh, you know, I've sort of spoken a bit about it briefly on my channel before, but it, basically is a kind of character study of these um, these characters in Naples and it it does so in such a beautiful way because we really get these deep tricky flaws exposed in such a a, a powerful and arresting way throughout the story and I I just found myself um, without it sounding really pretentious to say like Naples is also a character in this book it kind of is it it's kind of interrogated in quite the same way that some of these other characters are and I just found it really quite profound and quite moving the way it explored what it's like to find yourself at a sort of certain crossroads particularly kind of what, both historical and um, with in terms of sort of empire and other things but also um, kind of in terms of identity and kind of trying to work out what to do next and the characters therefore come across in this really interesting powerful way um and it's so spare as a book it's you know i think just under 200 pages but it it, it really explores these characters and this kind of these inner lives in a way that i found really quite moving um and yeah again this is a book that i think again i'd heard of Sh shelley hazard but I hadn't really checked out anything of hers and i think What's so clever is how this book is able to take those stories and again find this sort of softness in, in it all, but also paint Naples in a sort of really beautiful, colourful, vivid way. And so the language feels very spare in certain parts, but then explodes in these sort of rushes of colour. Um, and I think the front cover of the book, at least the, the, the version I read, kind of felt like that as well, this sort of explosion of colour, but there's a, there's a real sort of sparseness to it as well. Um, and I just thought it was, it was stunning. Next up uh, was Mary Renault with uh, The Fire From Heaven. And this is, um, I think, again, it's interesting with looking back on a prize like this because I wonder if a book like this would have been shortlisted at the time, uh, but kind of because Mary Renault had this whole series of books about Greek myths, whether that sort of in some ways influenced us looking back and thinking, ah, yes, Mary Renault released a book that year. Um, but this book I thought was, again, really fun. I, I sort of mentioned, I think, last time I spoke about this book, I often struggle with um, myths and legends, particularly kind of Greek ones, with keeping all the characters in my head. I don't really understand what's happening <laughs> most of the time. Um, and I thought this book did this really cleverly um, because we follow Alexander, 
as in the great um and we watch his sort of progression from being a young boy to the kind of leader of this army and we learn about his sort of exploits and the battles he has and i was worried it was sort of just going to stay in the kind of battles section which again i don't think i'd have found personally that exciting but i know it really works for people um but i thought what was really clever is it kind of moves from like the, the the historical and the mythical elements are always kind of at this really interesting tension and there's this really interesting line in between them where there are things that Alexander does that are sort of fantastical um, and a part of these myths that feel sort of supernatural but then other parts that feel very historically grounded and I think what's really clever about this book um, and again I listened to it, it's an audiobook and I think that was a really good way to get the kind of the bombastic explosions and kind of battle scenes and these sort of other sort of historical moments um, because that sort of tension was really quite interesting and I think made it feel like I wasn't just listening to some some sort of fantastical thing that was kind of not really grounded in anything but not a kind of dry historical thing either it, it kind of told the tale but brought out the sort of the like band of men kind of aspect of it you know the kind of this brotherhood between these men and Alexander is this figure who sort of proves himself at a very young age for being very fair to his sort of soldiers and and all the you know and a great leader in war and a great soldier and all these kinds of things um and a real kind of tension that kind of comes with that sort of violence um as well so i i thought this book was really cleverly done um and impressed me because it's a it's a genre that i often struggle most with i think and found myself really really enjoying it's being here for the ride for it so i would really i'd recommend this particularly if you are someone who likes kind of greek myths and um, particularly kind of these sort of big like battle scenes and all those sorts of things. It was very well handled, I thought. Next up was Muriel Spark, uh, The Light of My Life. I love her. Um, and this book I've spoken about recently as well, uh, Driver's Seat, which is just such a clever but also really brutal book. So this book is about 100 pages long and from the first few pages, or very early on, we learn that she is going to die in 24 hours. And we're not necessarily told all of the details of her death, we're kind of told roughly where she's found. Um, but the book starts, you know, after we, we find that she's going to die, um, it's just her on a, on a flight getting very excited about the idea of going um, abroad. And so she's sort of, you know, nothing can kind of bring her down, you know, she sat on a... Um, she sat on, on the plane next to this man who's sort of trying to shill all these sort of uh, nutritional, sort of faux nutritional, I think it's macrobiotic uh, products. And it's sort of, we're meant to sort of see him as just this sort of, sort of slightly annoying, frustrating, somewhat horrendous man, just sort of trying to shill products and sort of just not very trustworthy. And then obviously this sort of subplot comes in that we know, well, the main plot really, that we know that she's going to die. And so we think maybe he is a, you know the hands of it and it becomes this really interesting sort of detective story in reverse where we start with the knowledge that she's going to die and therefore i think somebody called it a why done it instead of a who done it in the sense of we know she's going to die and we know some of the details so as a result we read the whole story investigating every single character almost and not trusting anybody and I really don't want to spoil it, but the ending of this is supreme. I think this is such a sublime way of handling it. I kind of had to reread the end bit several times to make sure I'd got it right because I couldn't quite believe what Muriel Spark had just done. Um, this book again is very funny, um, I, which doesn't sound like it. I think when I spoke about it before, I kind of said it's like almost a kind of roll Dahl kind of humour of like, things are so brutal and then she finds a kind of absurdity in that humour around it. And so, you know, in the same way that Roald Dahl characters will be killed by being trampled on by a hippopotamus, there's something really tragic about it, but also an absurd image of a hippopotamus and the word um, kind of makes it, not to say funny, but absurd and kind of, yeah. So it, it felt like that. And I, this is such a clever book. Um, and particularly what it does in a hundred pages is really nothing short of spectacular, I thought. Um, I, I really was blown away by this and I think, apart from Birds on the Trees, this would be my other favourite to win if I were a judge on, on the 1970 Lost Booker Prize. And from a book that is 100 pages to a book that is just over 600, uh, The Vivisector by Patrick White. And a few years after 
um, this book came out, he would win the Nobel Prize. So this sort of, uh, this Australian author, I believe, um, this book, kind of the vivisector, the idea around it, um, the, the kind of central vivisector is about this idea that he has this mother who, uh, this sort of, this kind of main character we're told, he's a sort of painter, he is, has this sort of mother who is constantly worried about um, animal welfare and so she's always threatening or sort of being worried about the vivisector or vivisection itself and the idea that animals are gonna come to harm and um, I hope I hope and he's not really listening to this um, but and this sort of idea and over the course of this book there's this really sort of sumptuous language that tells the story of this painter and we get I mean as you might be able to tell from a 600 page book we get his whole life <laughs> from very young child to sort of aging man and um, we sort of see a lot of his sort of history through life with it and these kind of, so again, sort of slightly bombastic set of characters, these sort of wealthy socialites and sort of art dealers and, and whatever, but also these sort of bohemian interesting characters and, and everything, everything else. And I, as much as I, I would have preferred this book to be a little shorter, I um, also think there was so much that was interesting in this. And, there is some, something to be said about that slow unravelling of a story that is really captivating and I think particularly when you're talking about a painter um, it's also really interesting when the language feels like it captures that kind of vibrancy and that kind of florid exciting kind of thing um, and I think it does do that on many occasions um, so even though overall I think it's a book I kind of struggled with some of the the, the pace of and um, and I struggled with a bit, a little bit around the length and some details, uh, like, did we really need? Um, I also think that was part of its charm. There is, in some ways, this is the slow building of a painting. Like, we get this sort of base sort of coverage and sort of slowly add these, these sort of textures to it and these colours to it as we go. And it turns into this sort of much bigger, bolder thing as a result at the end. So, um, even though, yeah, even though it wasn't always my cup of tea, I still think there's a lot of really good stuff in this and I can totally see um, people absolutely loving this. And it was interesting reading the Goodreads um, reviews for it and so many people sort of saying this is for them a perfect novel and you know I, I really want to read more of Patrick White's books following this because um, even though this didn't always fully work for me there's something about his writing that I think I'd really enjoy and maybe a sort of tighter focus um, kind of book. But that brings us to the end of this shortlist. So the Lost Man book of Pro the Lost I keep on saying man, the Lost Booker Prize. Uh, and these books are therefore books that were not kind of championed, but the winner of this prize, uh, J.G. Farrell's Troubles, was still, is still kind of counted as a legitimate winner. Um, uh, so it's sort of, J.G. Farrell still is a two-time two winning um, Booker, uh, Booker uh, you know what I mean, he's won twice. Uh, and I think for me, my personal choices, as you can probably tell from what I'm saying, are probably Mural Sparks Driver's Seat, I think is right up there. I just think it's so clever and so startling as a book. And I think if any of Muriel Sparks' three shortlisted um, books, Public Image, uh, Loitering with Intent and Driver's Seat, if any of her three shortlisted books were to win, I think this is the one. Um, and I'm always gutted that we were, we didn't have the prize at the time, because I would love to have seen Muriel Spark potentially be shortlisted for it, sort of properly, like at the time, and potentially win for a book so startling and, and brutal. Um, but I'm glad that we've at least got some chance to sort of look back and, and appreciate it. Um, but yeah, Birds on the Trees by Nina Borden, I think would possibly be my runner-up, if not The Bay of Noon by Shirley Hazard. I think all three books have such an interesting perspective, particularly really capturing uh, the sort of inner lives of women in a way that's really... I think that it was really quite daring, actually. I think they were not afraid to paint their female characters as like sort of alternatively sort of these really beautiful charming characters but also kind of monsters in various other ways and I think there's something so interesting about the way they're written so I would really really highly recommend them anyway uh, if you know of any other books that were written in 1969 or published in 1969 that that could have been good for this do let me know um, and if you've checked out any of these and um, or want to check out any of these please do also let me know Annie is being very calm and quiet which is unnerving I feel like I'm now going to have an evening of having to run around with her throwing a ball again just to tire her out uh, but I've been Bob with Annie and talking about the Booker Prize take care and speak to you all soon bye bye